This episode is a rebroadcast of a Delivering Miracles episode that is a listener favorite. Can't wait for you to enjoy this one again. Delivering Miracles is a proud member of Parents on Demand, a network of high quality shows for families like yours and mine. Download the free network app on any Apple and Android devices and listen to your favorite episodes on the go. Before we get started, I wanted to share something really exciting. For the first time ever, Ever. There's finally a book specifically for women with high-risk pregnancies and how to manage your stress so you can have a healthy pregnancy even if you've got complications. It's called Pregnancy Brain, and I'm really excited to share it with you. To learn more about the book, head over to PregnancyBrainBook.com. That's PregnancyBrainBook.com. I can't wait for you to check it out. Welcome to Delivering Miracles, a podcast to teach women like you tips and strategies on how you can have a safer pregnancy so you can bring home a healthy baby. I'm your host and your high-risk pregnancy expert, Parijat Deshpande. I can't wait to chat with you. Before we get started, I wanted to share something really exciting. For the first time ever, there's finally a book specifically for women with high-risk pregnancies and how to manage your stress so you can have a healthy pregnancy even if you've got complications. It's called Pregnancy Brain, and I'm really excited to share it with you. To learn more about the book, head over to PregnancyBrainBook.com. That's PregnancyBrainBook.com. I can't wait for you to check it out. Have you ever seen that image that is going around social media. It's been a little while now, many months, I think, where there are seven women and they're all wearing different colors of the rainbow and they're holding their babies. It is the most powerful image. I literally have goosebumps right now as I'm talking about this, imagining that photo. It is such a beautiful image. And it highlights this idea of having a rainbow baby, which I'll be honest, I didn't know what it was until I had one of my own. My son is a rainbow baby, and a rainbow baby is the baby that's born after you've experienced loss of any kind, whether you had a miscarriage, an ectopic pregnancy, a chemical pregnancy, a preemie who didn't survive, infant loss, any kind of loss like that, and then you have a baby after. They're called a rainbow baby, which I think is such a beautiful image to have. You know, They say that at the end of a storm comes a beautiful rainbow. And that I think is a beautiful way to remember that as you're weathering that storm. If you listen to my episode about my first loss, and if you haven't, I'll link it in the show notes below, it changes you. And it it really, you can almost hear your heart breaking, at least for me. And to then be pregnant after It comes with so many different emotions. You're, of course, I was, you know, thrilled to be pregnant again. I was terrified of losing this baby. And then I had a very high risk pregnancy on top of that. So it just kind of compounded that fear. But having a rainbow baby is something a lot of women and a lot of couples know about. And it's not something we talk a lot about because there's almost this feeling like, well, you're pregnant again. So be happy. It's all over. And that's just not what the reality is. You never forget the baby that you lost. And that's why I'm so, so glad to have my dear friend and colleague, Christine McAllister, here to talk about her experience of being pregnant after loss and of having a beautiful rainbow baby and how she turned tragedy into triumph. Christine McAllister is a business and success coach and the author of The Income Replacement Formula. Seven Simple Steps to Doing What You Love and Making Six Figures from Anywhere. Her company, Life with Passion, helps high-achieving, motivated go-getters use their unique gifts and challenges to quit and stay out of their nine-to-five jobs by creating and growing online businesses out of their passions. As a mom of an angel and a rainbow baby, she's also an expert on turning tragedy into triumph. Welcome, Christine. I'm so glad that you're here on Delivering Miracles today. Thank you so much for having me. Me too. This, I mean, you are 
such a light in my life. I can't even begin to tell you. And I'm just so excited to be sharing your story with our listeners because I know it's something that a lot of people can relate to on so many different levels. So I would love to just open it up to you and you know, tell us a little bit about your story and how you came to be who you are today. Sure. So my story as it relates to <laughs> delivering my own miracles began several years ago when I experienced three early miscarriages. And to be honest, that's really how I found out that I could be pregnant at all because that was never a certainty on my oh journey. Boy. And so, you know, I, I really dealt with the the confirmation and the loss at the same time. You know, okay, this is something that is possible for me, but then also is it, right? And so after going through those those three first trimester miscarriages, and obviously we can talk about any of this in more detail that you want. A few months after my third miscarriage, I became pregnant again and went through a totally normal pregnancy, normal for the baby, not normal for me. I became very, very depressed in the first trimester, very, very sick through the whole pregnancy. Do you think the depression had anything to do with your past losses? You know, to be completely transparent, I wasn't very connected to those losses because they were so early and because it was such a it was such a sort of a confusing time for me. I I don't think I fully grieved them until later. I don't think I fully understood what I had lost until later. And so perhaps on some subconscious level, but what I, you know, I was I was dealing with the grief, but what I came to understand is that Perinatal depression affects a lot more women than is talked about. And yes, very true. Right. And so when I saw my doctor and kind of opened up to her, because of course there's a the pressure, oh, you should be so excited, blah, 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 blah. She was like, let me tell you something that I don't tell many people. I became very depressed when I was pregnant with my first child. Oh, and wow. I love that she told you that. I do too. It was such a relief because here she is, obviously someone who loves babies. She's an OBGYN, right? And she experienced that for herself. And so was able, like that was such a moment for me of going, oh my gosh, I'm not crazy that I'm laying on the couch staring at the wall that I've lost 10 pounds, that I've just like lost my zest for life. Because I am a busy, like, you know, go getter who's just like always doing stuff. And it was the complete opposite for me in the first trimester. Totally. That was very difficult. And then, but, you know, the baby was healthy, everything was fine, and continued to be that way until we had a routine 37 week appointment. And we had just had two baby showers the weekend before. And the baby had been quiet the Monday after our two showers, but I thought, oh my gosh, I'm exhausted. This baby's exhausted. We didn't know what we were having, a boy or a girl. We kept it a surprise. And so I said, oh, we're going to have an appointment tomorrow on Tuesday and I'll just you know, double check. Everything's fine then. So when I, when I went, I said, hey, you know, can we just like confirm like right away? Would you just mind putting the Doppler on and confirming there's, you know, everything's fine because the baby's been real quiet. And uh, there was no heartbeat. And so that's oh how we, gosh. that's and how we found out. 37 weeks when you don't never expect that to happen so never, late. Never. Right. I mean, at that point, like I was packing a bag for the hospital. We had put the car seat in the car, right? It was, I could go at any time. And at this point we just put our feet up and wait. Right. How did you feel when you heard that news in the room? Well, are there words to describe that? I, I mean, I can't even imagine. You know, it was very much shock. At first, the care provider who we were seeing went and got the head OB of the practice, right? And then they put us on an ultrasound machine instead of the little heartbeat microphone that I can't think of the name for right now <laughs> and had me lay down. And so actually like saw the picture, right, of of our little baby who was not moving. And he was the one who made the pronouncement that, that our baby had passed away. And at that point, you know, sent us straight to the hospital, which was, oh, an hour plus from where we were. 
And so they ushered us out the side door so that we didn't have to go back out into the waiting room with all the other pregnant people. And it's very considerate of them to do that. It was, it was. When I got into the car is when it just, I just broke down, you know, because while of course everybody is hoping there's something wrong with the equipment, there was a mistake. Like I knew, you know, I just knew. You just knew. That. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And, you know, that began the process of double checking at the hospital, being induced, you know, delivering this baby and, and that life altering 24 hours. Oh my gosh. I, I cannot even begin to imagine. And thank you for sharing that. You did something very beautiful. It turned out you had a daughter, right? Yes. A little girl named Maeve Evelyn. Oh my God. I love that name so much. <laughs> thank you. And you did something very beautiful to honor her life. Yes. Are you talking about in the hospital or afterward or... I'm talking about the your foundation, but anything. Oh, yeah. I mean, wh- how you really honored her has been a, a really beautiful journey to witness. Thank you. When when we were sitting in the hospital, and I'm hooked up to all these machines, and you know, looking down at my pregnant belly, knowing that I was going to deliver this baby who we found out was a girl and we named before she was born, uh, knowing that she'd already passed away, my my husband had this vision of this endless road, like stretching out in front of us. How are we going to survive this road for the rest of our lives? How are we going to live our lives without our daughter? Right. And he tied it into his journey as an endurance athlete, which has been a source of great uh, peacemaking, I guess, for a lot of the things that he's dealt with in his life, being in the water, being on a bike, running, He's done Ironmans and things that are even crazier than Ironmans uh, all over the world. And those things have helped him to cope with with things that he's experienced that have been tough. And so he really wanted to provide a way for other people who are going through something or coping with something or wanted to honor a, a lost life by helping other people complete an impossible task. Because to us, living life now seemed impossible. And so together, we came up with this nonprofit, Miles with Maeve, which borrows from the team and training model to help raise, help raise money for the four organizations that helped us survive in the wake of Maeve's loss. So we provide grants to them so that they can serve other, other lost families. And in exchange, my husband provides coaching on anything from a 5K to an, an Ironman or a massive swim, ultra marathon, whatever, and our athletes raise money. That is incredible. And that's so, so open hearted of you all to, to think of that in the midst of your biggest heartbreak. Well, you know, I think it had to be inspired, right? And I think that. I appreciate that so much. And I know that that he will too, as as he listens to this. I think that we just looked at each other in the hospital and went, we don't know anyone this has happened to. This doesn't happen. How are we going to get through this? And so for us, you know, beginning to create some meaning and beginning to find ways to create a legacy for her, as her parents, that seemed like the one parental thing we could do for her, that has really helped us to survive and not that we will ever be okay with her loss. And I think that any lost parent can, can relate to us on this. It has certainly helped us to cope. Absolutely. It gives so much meaning then it's, and like you said, it's not a replacement for her life, but it does give you something to hold on to, to really honor her and and you all and what you all experienced together as a family. Absolutely. And I think too, when we experience loss before birth, there's a way in which we're even more scared than than the average person who's lost someone that that person will be forgotten because we don't have memories, right? We don't have yes. like my husband says, right? We don't know what color her eyes were. You yeah. know, we never got to hear her voice. Right. And so so the only pictures we have are sonograms and the pictures we took in the hospital right after she was born. So like, you know, those things made it even more important for us to 
to find ways to make sure she wasn't forgotten. And as I like to say, you know, running my own business, writing about her a lot in my book, like I get to make her as famous as I want. And I love that. Yeah, totally. I think one of the things that I love about you and all the conversations we've had about this is how much you have embraced this. And I I cannot imagine how hard that must be to do, but you've really embraced her and made her a part of your life, your family, your business. And that makes it easy for the rest of us to say, oh yeah, Maeve. Yeah, of course. Mm. She's here, you know? Yeah, I love that. And it's funny that you say that because often my friends, when they're talking about my rainbow baby, will accidentally say Maeve. And then they're immediately horrified that they did that. But it doesn't bother me. I love to hear her name. You know, I really do. And I think it's losing her was such a turning point in my life that it only makes sense that she sort of centrally features in my life now. Yeah, absolutely. So your journey doesn't end there, though. You all decided that you wanted to try again to have another baby. How did you even begin that discussion? Well, you know, when we were sitting with our our midwife before I went to the hospital to be induced, she kind of came in to tell us, okay, these are this is what this means. This this is the deal. Here's where we go today, but then also told us how it affected our possibility for future children, because obviously we wanted to know, right? And God bless her. She was in tears. You know, she obviously this has got to be one of uh, is we've been told many times since the hardest thing that care providers deal with. Absolutely. Right. in in this field. And I appreciate the tears. I remember my OBs coming in and having tears in their eyes when we thought we were going to lose my son at 22 weeks. And I really appreciated the sentiment that, okay, you're right here with me emotionally. Yes. Especially because they have to do this, right? Like this is part of their job. And so I can see ways in which it would be much easier to be closed off about it. Totally. Right. Because how do you cope with that? Mm you know, every so often. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I feel like once because, in a lifetime is hard enough. Anything more than that is almost impossible. And of course they got into this. I'm assume, assuming most of our care providers got into this because they really care. And so to actually be able to be present and to grieve with you and to not become so callous that it's just, well, it's fine. You can try again. Right. You know, is is really a beautiful gift. Absolutely. Yeah, but she told us, you know, this this should not affect your possibilities for future pregnancies. And you can try again in three months. And at the time, those 90 days felt like forever, right? All we wanted was a baby to hold. And of yeah. course, that was the one thing that we didn't have. Mm-hmm. And then I began fertility treatments because I've been diagnosed with PCOS. And so when we were quote unquote allowed, I began fertility treatments. Did those for several months and the medication that I was taking made me crazy. (laughs) And so many of our listeners can really empathize with that. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Right. As if I wasn't already crazy enough being postpartum, postpartum after a full term stillbirth and breathing. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Right. Breeding ground for turning into a monster and just exactly. not being able to create. <laughs> exactly. So I finally told my husband, I got to take a break because this is making me lose my mind. Like, I just can't. I just can't do it. And so we did. We took a break for several months. I tried a different medication and then became pregnant on the first first try with that one. Oh, and Yeah. And then I had to endure pregnancy after a loss. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a whole other beast of a pregnancy. It is Completely. a whole other experience. Tell us what that was like for you. The best way to describe it is that I was a hot mess. Thankfully, there was a different medication that helped better uh, with the morning sickness and you know all day, all the time sickness that I had. And so I wasn't as sick as I had been with Maeve. But our approach was pretty much the opposite. I had planned to deliver Maeve naturally. And, you know, we had been very minimalistic about our 
interventions and things like that during the pregnancy with Maeve and everything was normal. So we had no reason to be any different with Fiora, my rainbow baby. Of course, I was now high risk. I was being treated as high risk and I wanted to do everything possible. So, so the OB's midwife told me I could come in anytime to check the heartbeat. If I was getting nervous, if I felt even before I could feel movement, just to reassure myself, which I did. And we had moved a little over an hour away from the town where the practice was and the hospital was, but I kept those care providers because I didn't want to work with anyone else. Yeah. And I knew they were, I knew how they were. That right? trust I just is thought, so important when you know they understand not just your body, but what you've been through to get to yes. that point is so critical. Yes. Yes, exactly. You, you said it. And these were the only people, some of the only people other than our parents who met Maeve, you know, yeah. I didn't want to get to know anyone else or share this experience with anyone yes. else. I really understand that. Yeah. Right. It's so important. It is. There's this unspoken language about the context in within which this moment is happening that you just really need to know that you're surrounded by people who speak that language with you. Exactly. Yep, exactly. And some of these, you know, women had become athletes for Miles with Maeve as a way of coping with, Oh my gosh, I love that. Isn't that cool? Yeah, we've had a lot of L&D nurses train with us for that very reason. They need an outlet for what they, what we were just talking about. But I really didn't go out in public much during my pregnancy. I joked with my husband that I was going to get a huge shirt with a big no sign on it (laughs) and wear that because I thought I might lose it if someone tried to touch my belly or be like, oh, it's so exciting. Everything's going to be okay. Right? (laughs) Right. Obviously, for me, there was no safe point in the pregnancy. (laughs) No feeling better after the first time. Absolutely. so I wore sunglasses in inside in the grocery store. I mean, I did everything that I could to make myself completely unapproachable. <laughs> I, I understand that because you cut you've created this bubble around you to just protect yourself to get through every moment. You you can't risk having somebody break that and bring in other emotion that that's on top of everything else that you're already dealing no. with. No. And we had already experienced people saying stupid stuff to us about oh my God. why, you know, why Maeve died or what blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I know strangers can be idiots. I know friends and family can be idiots about this stuff. They just don't know what they to don't. say. So typically they say the wrong yeah. thing <laughs> and it's super triggering and I'm just not available. For Absolutely. That. Good for you for knowing that. <laughs> Good for you. Really? Well, you learn the hard way, right? I even wrote an article for the Huffington Post about, like, I think it's called Four Things Not to Say, you know? Yes. And just really unpacking, right? Because because you hear the same things over and over right. and they're extremely unhelpful. And it's not because people are mean. It's just because they don't they know. Don't know. You know. I totally yeah. get that. And I think what I learned the hard way too, obviously, Behan survived, but – we have the same kind of experience. People don't know what to do when a baby's born at the edge of viability. They don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it comes from their own really overwhelming emotions about the reality that a baby Mm -hmm. might not survive. Like we like to believe that babies are untouchable and they're just, they're perfect and they're going to survive and everything's fine. And that's totally not what you and I experienced. Exactly. And it's hard (laughs) for a lot of people to wrap their heads around. And so then they say stupid things. Right. And it just, in an attempt to soothe themselves or you or feel the silence or whatever. Yes, yes, yes. Right, right. So at the end of my pregnancy, of course, I was doing everything I could to convince my team that we needed to deliver before the point at which Maeve had died. And at first we had a plan I felt really good about, and then they changed their minds. I think for liability reasons, and I had a complete freak out. And wound up being in and out, wound up going to the hospital several times for monitoring when I would feel like her movement was slowing down. And each time they would keep me overnight, they would monitor, and each time they would send me home. And I even joked about breaking my own water with a like a little pipe cleaner because I was so 
You were scared. So just, I was. I was like, this baby is perfect. Maeve was perfect. If we have a 37 weeker who has a few issues but is alive, I'm cool with that. You know, like it's all this idea of I I don't trust my my body at past a certain yeah. point. Yes. Right? Yes, absolutely. So eventually they found a reason the third time I went in for testing and uh, or monitoring and stayed overnight. And then she was breech and they knew I didn't want a C-section if at all possible. And so they manually turned her and no one was more surprised than the doctor that that worked. Like from the outside, <laughs> he turned her around. <laughs> I think he was doing it to humans, right. <laughs> but it worked. And, and then they were like, okay, don't move. We're going to break your water right now before she moves. <laughs> And then I was induced to deliver this baby. He was born in the middle of the night and we had champagne for all the oh, nurses wow. at like 2.30 <laughs> in the morning. And the nurses who had delivered Maeve came in, even though they weren't even working to help deliver. And her first entrance into the world was not without a little bit of trepidation and some issues and suctioning and potential issue, like potential other things and some epinephrine and stuff. They told me she was being quote lazy oh and I couldn't see anything. I know, <laughs> but I mean, she was okay. Oh my gosh. What was it like to hold her for the first time? Well, it was, I mean, it was beautiful. I think I was a little out of it from the drugs, to be honest with you. <laughs> I believe that. Sure. Everybody else in the room was crying and I was number one, exhausted, and number two, probably a little bit high from hitting that pain, <laughs> extra pain pump over yeah. and over. But it was a moment of looking down and going, I actually get to do this, right? I actually get to do this. She's adorable. She's beautiful. She's looking up at me. She even had a little smile on her face, like, what newborn baby does that, right? And I felt like she had been with Maeve and she knew. So she knew Maeve on, in some level, in some way. And so she knew who she was, what she was here to do. And I've always had this sense about her that like, either she's an old soul or just that she, she gets it, right? She's not like this wide-eyed baby who wanders around as if she's seeing everything for the first time. Like she's very comfortable, very secure, very, this really interesting, unique little wow. person who seems to be pretty aware of her yeah. role. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. And being led by parents like you, I'm not surprised. Oh, well, thank you so much. I mean, I feel very grateful that she chose us, but also we can both be kind of neurotic. We both deal with anxiety <laughs> and depression. So the fact that we have like this super, and we're both brown hair, brown eyed, and our baby is blonde hair with curls and bright blue eyes. <laughs> So if you want any more proof that she's probably actually an angel, I'm like, where did you come from? Oh my from, gosh, right? I love it's that. Super confident little baby. It's so funny. Oh, yeah. wow. Like signs from the universe. Like I've got you. Oh, You've got cool. your angel with you, watching over you, taking care of you when you guys are having your moment. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh my gosh. What do you feel has been the biggest shift for you in I'm not even going to say getting over because there's no, there is no getting over, but maybe shifting from that place of tragedy and creating this beautiful life that you can really enjoy. Because I think that's what really stands out to me is as I hear and see you and speak with you, you've really come to a place where you are enjoying your life. And how did you do that after everything you've been through? Mm. Obviously, it's been a process, right? There were days when I felt really, really um, proud of myself if I took a shower. Yeah, absolutely. But, and that's the reality. I'm glad you shared that because that's a reality. Okay. Some days, if you can just get out of yeah. bed for five minutes, that's the biggest yep. win. Yep. I mean, brushing my hair, I was like, I didn't even consider doing that like for weeks. So, I mean, so a shower when it became like probably medically necessary was like a huge <laughs> <Right>. win. <laughs> and I will never sugarcoat that. But I think that I, I really did realize very early on that this was going to define me one way or another, that this was the thing in my life that was the big, the biggest tragedy I would ever experience. And 
I knew that how I chose to look at that and what I chose to do with that and how I chose to live my life as a result was going to be one of two ways. It was either going to break me or it was going to make me like to sound, I mean, that's very cliche, but I I knew it would. And I could see very clearly that I could go into this cycle of depression and numbing myself with anything that I could find and hiding out from the world. Or I could choose to make Maeve famous. I could choose to help other people. I could choose to raise awareness because, I mean, this we now know so many people who've experienced something similar and just as you do, right? Just as like as you listeners do when you start talking about it, you realize just how common oh, yes. your experience yes. is, even if you thought nobody else had been through it when it first happened to you because people don't people want to talk about, about it, it right? right? Right, right. And so I decided I was going to choose the make it. And I, I decided that I was going to go to the next level in my in my career and what I did and the impact that I made in the world, I was going to just become unapologetic about being and doing what I was here to do, first figuring out what that was, and then doing it, because I wasn't scared anymore. I wasn't scared anymore of, about what people thought. I wasn't scared anymore of failing. Like, like I said, I'd already been through like the worst thing I will ever go through. I firmly believe that. And so now it's completely up to me to create the life that I want in, you know, in spite of, and also as a result of that. I literally have goosebumps and tears as I'm listening to you. There's nothing more to say. I love that. Thank you. It's just, this is why I love you. This is why we're, this is why you're in my life. This is why we're on this show right now, because you made that choice and you made a choice that's really hard to make for those of us, Mm. those of our listeners who are listening in, it's not easy to make that choice but you can make that choice. It is a choice. And when you find that strength again, and you can think again, and you can see that fork in the road, you can choose. And you can build that team around you to help build you up as you choose to make it. Absolutely. Mm. Mm. I love this. I love this. So from here, I mean, from, from where you've been to where you are now, you've just grown leaps and bounds personally, professionally. Tell us what you're up to these days. Yeah. So when Maeve died, I was running a digital marketing agency and I've always known I wanted to be an entrepreneur and I quit my job back in 2010 and it was, I had, I had done that for five years when she died. And I was successful at it. I was booked out, but I knew that there was another level for me. And so as a result of that, what we were just talking about, I made the choice to figure out what that level was to actually make like the impact in the world based around exactly what I was uniquely gifted and called to do. And what I realized is that what I'm here to do is to help other people build, build their lives lives with passion, right? That's the name of my company and businesses that they love. I've always tried to do that for my friends and family, whether they wanted to be entrepreneurs or not. I've always tried to talk them into it. And (laughs) when I did this work, I began to realize that, hey, maybe what I was meant to do was to help people who actually had that desire, just like I did. Because I believe if you have that desire, you have it for a reason. And so my mission, my goal is to make that path as clear and as simple as possible to help you start a side hustle, replace your income and and quit your job and do what you love and do it in a way that also serves the life that you want to have, right? So that you can spend time with the people that you love so that you can travel if you love traveling like I do and not become a slave to your business. And so that's what I've been doing since Maeve died. And I just uh, last month wrote a book, released a book about it. It's now a bestseller. Woo! You know, you wouldn't guess it by looking at the the cover or by picking it up, but Maeve is on uh, in every chapter on almost every page. I mean, her her little life, her fingerprints, you know, the memories that we have for the experience, what we've been talking about here is of course was the inspiration for my business and the inspiration for the book as well. I think that's what really hits home for me too is just 
how much we we talked about this, just how much you've embraced this and how much this is integrated into your new life. You know, and I don't know if new life is even fair to say. It's just this this version of your life that your business, your passion, your life, your family, it all includes Maeve. Yes. And it includes your experience, your journey, and and you talk about it so freely, which is really inspiring for many of us who we've talked about it several times. Feel like we're alone. Feel like we're the only ones that are going through it. Yeah. And that there's no light at the end of it. Yep. Yeah. And I think I really believe that we all have already survived things. Many of many of you, something similar to part or all of my journey, but that we've already survived things that are probably harder than anything that's going to be required of us in terms of going for our dream life, you know? And I think that's part of the reason that I do choose to be so open about it because I want people to know that you can have something terrible happen to you, right? One of the worst losses that psychologists classify and still create a happy life. You know, I want you to know that you can go through a really dark time with your, you know, your partner as a result. And that's probably a whole other episode and still go on to have a happy relationship after something like this. And, (laughs) you know, I think there's, there's a strength to be found in realizing what you've already survived because like I shared earlier, it, it sort of diminishes the, the fear of the unknown of, of trying new things when you think, I got through that somehow. Yeah. Right? I got through that somehow. I'm, I'm pretty like, I'm pretty amazing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's something we don't talk enough about. How amazing are we to have gone through what we've been through? And I'm talking to you as the listeners as well. How amazing are you? to have survived what you've survived so far. We, we minimize this so much, but you're so right. We need to stop for a second and go, I'm freaking amazing for having gone through what I've been through so far. Yeah, and yes. still getting out of bed and probably more. <laughs> right, yes, <laughs> right, yes. So I'm curious, how, do, how does your experience with Maeve impact how you parent Fiora? That's a great question. I think I decided early on and in total ignorance, that I was not really available to complain a whole lot about what parenting was like. Now, Fiora has been, as I shared, she is probably an actual angel. So she's been, <laughs> she's been a, a wonderful baby. I, of course, have nothing to no, you know, living children to compare parenting her to. But I decided that all these round the clock feedings and this and that and everything that happens with parenting and having no idea what I'm doing and building a business basically at the same time as a business baby, a book baby and a rainbow baby all at the same time. I just decided I was unavailable to complain about it too much. And I think it's for me, it's a really different perspective knowing what I lost, right? And and having this extreme gratitude for the gift of this baby. And also, it's that much harder knowing how she could have a sister who's, you know, would be three right now. And how much fun would that be to watch them interact and asking how do we remember her and explain this to her without it overshadowing her? I mean, those are the kinds of questions and conversations that we have a lot. But I think that, of course, there are times I get frustrated. And uh, right now she is entering the twos and has discovered a new uh, decibel level of screeching. (laughs) And you know, there are times that I, you know, need a break, of course, like, I'm not saying I never have those moments. But most of the time, what I feel is just over overwhelming gratitude for the opportunity, you know, to parent to parent a living child and to get to know this little person. And I think that that is the result of, of absolutely, what I you know, on um, delivering miracles, we talk a lot about this idea of grief and gratitude, 
not being mutually exclusive, that you can be grieving, you can mourn the loss and still feel tremendously grateful for the children that you do have or the experiences that you do have or the memories that you do have. And what strikes me, Christine, is that I wonder if creating this nonprofit, Miles with Maeve, has allowed you to have that parallel experience of being able to mourn and also remember her while being able to have the space to be so grateful for Fiora. Yeah, I think that's so true. And it's so funny that you say that. Another way that you and I are completely aligned is that I wrote a series on grief and gratitude. Of course you did. (laughs) (laughs) Of course I did. And I completely agree with you. I mean, it's it's always going to be both. And I think that's just life. Like anything is never just one thing or the other. It's always both. But for grief and and gratitude, certainly they they can coexist. And and obviously Miles with Maeve and having that meaning and being able to support other lost families, but also to be able to just, like you've said, have her as integrated into every part of my daily life, it, it doesn't feel all the time as much to me as like, she's not here. It's more like in a way she is. Yeah. Yeah. I can really understand that. That really resonates. You found a way to keep her here. That feels really good for you and your family. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I could talk to you all day. You know that. (laughs) But yeah, <laughs> I know our <laughs> listeners have other things to do too. So my my final question for you, Christine, is what are your final words of hope for women who are listening in right now who are currently pregnant with their rainbow baby and are trying to balance this whole grief and gratitude journey that they're going to be on for the rest of their lives? What are your final words of hope for them? Keep listening to this show (laughs) because I feel that this is a very safe space. You're listening to someone who really knows what she's talking about. And, And I think that having community where you can talk openly about your loss with people who are just as they're comfortable, you know, saying your child's name or talking about the baby that you lost or, or whatever is true for you, being able to have that experience is so freeing and helps the grieving process so, so, so much. Because of course, you're going to be grateful for this baby. You're, you already are and probably have, if you're anything like me, also a heightened level of anxiety <laughs> right. about, about the baby. But I think being able to, being able to share as, as cheesy as that sounds and have people that you can text or call or reach out to online when, when the grief is, is pulling at you or when you're seeking to balance it or looking for ways to remember and also honor. That's the thing that will keep you sane and as close to centered as you can hope to be in this process. I, I love that. That's just so beautiful. And it is so, so true. And it is also very accessible. We're, we're so lucky to have, to be in a time where there's technology, there's social media, there's all these opportunities to connect with people, even if it's not in person, but around the world, people who have been through what we've been through and to connect and really build these bonds with each other. So thank you for sharing that. And where can people find you if they want to know more about Miles with Maeve or about the work that you do? if they are ready to live that life and create that business that they are dreaming of? Yes. So mileswithmave.org is the nonprofit's website. And Maeve is spelled M-A-E-V-E. And my business's website is lifewithpassion.com. If you are interested in quitting your job, then you can grab a free PDF that I have for you on exactly how to do that, how to escape the nine to five world at lifewithpassion.com slash miracles. But I'd also love to connect with you. So feel free to, to reach out to me anytime. You can do that on my website. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing your story so openly and honestly and Thank you for being you. You are such a light in this world. Oh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share 
my story and for doing this podcast and right back at you for being you. Thank you. I'm so grateful to know you. Oh my gosh. I am just, I feel different. Do you feel different after listening to that? I feel different. I just feel so much hope. I feel so much hope. And that's something that really drew me to Christine when I first met her is she's not naively hopeful. You know, she's not just, hey, everything will be fine. It'll be okay. Don't worry about it. Because we all know that's not true, right? We all know better than that. We know it's not true. But what I love is she's created this life. She's created her business in a way that really embraces what she's been through. I said that like 15 times on this episode already, but that really is what really connects with me and and what really strikes me most is it's okay to embrace what you've been through. It's necessary to embrace what you've been through. Talk about it, own it, name it, and demand that the people around you respect it and own it and name it too. And as you've probably seen, yes, your support system is going to change. Mine certainly did. After my loss, after my son was born, it happens. But know that through this filter, when you own what you have been through and you turn that tragedy into triumph, you are going to draw some of the most supportive, strongest people into your life to lift you up as you embrace and create this life that you have always dreamt of, no matter what you've been through to get to this moment. You deserve it. Thank you so much for joining me here today. And if you loved today's episode as much as I did, I would love for you to head over to Apple Podcasts by iTunes and leave a review so more women who are going through loss, who are pregnant after loss, who have a high-risk pregnancy can tune into Delivering Miracles to receive this inspiration, to hear these stories of hope on how they can get through the difficulties of their challenging times of building their family. And if you haven't already, I would love for you to check out my brand new book, Pregnancy Brain, which is all about how to manage your stress effectively during your high-risk pregnancy so you can have a healthy pregnancy and give your baby a strong start to life. And you can do that at PregnancyBrainBook.com. And of course, I would love to stay in touch. So please say hello. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, or Facebook. I'm kind of all over. At Barijat Desh. That's P A R I J A T D E S H. This is your story, your journey, your ups and downs. You have every right to talk about it, own it, embrace it, and you deserve to create the life that you love, no matter what you've been through. Take it one day, one step at a time. You can do this.